QSO Today, Episode 298, Paul Taylor, VK3HN. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers for the radio amateur, reminding you to check out their new IC705 all-band portable transceiver. More on this later. And by QRP Labs, makers of the popular QCX kit transceiver and a whole host of parts and kits for the radio ham builder. The QCX is a great kit to build if you're in the COVID-19 lockdown. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. On the QSO Today homepage is a menu item called Expo on the upper right side of your screen. If you click on it, it will take you to more information about the QSO Today Virtual Ham Radio Expo. Me and my team are building out a virtual ham radio convention that includes speakers, exhibitors, and prizes, and more. We are working to make attending our convention fun and realistic. I had a fantastic response from my former guest to fill the speaker slots, and with the help of George KJ6VU from the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, we are lining up the speakers and building the tracks. Stay tuned for more information. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, your host. When it rains, it pours. So in this QSO Today episode with Paul Taylor, VK3HN, it's another down-under conversation about home brewing and building ham radio gear from QRP transceivers to carry into the field to solid-state AM transmitters for that mellow 80-meter transmitted sound. I know that you'll enjoy this QSO with VK3HN. VK3HN, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Paul? 4Z1UG, this is VK3HN. Hi, Eric. Hey, Paul. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Sure. Well, it started for me at a young age. Um, I was probably about 12 years old when, when I first started experimenting with all the usual sorts of things that Boys of my uh, my era were experimenting with crystal sets, one transistor radios, uh, buzzers, multi vibrators, um, all those sorts of uh, fun electronics and radio experiments. I guess the key thing for me, Eric, was that I have an older brother who is eight years older than me. His name is David. I'll, I'll refer to him on more than a few occasions because. He was a licensed amateur from a quite an early age, and so he really fostered my interest in radio and electronics. So he was always bringing home components and magazines and stories, and when I was a little bit older, bringing me into uh, radio activities such as some of the local clubs. What was your brother's call sign? His call sign was uh, VK3ZDT, Zulu Delta Tango. He was licensed right back in 1970 and uh and and i'm as i said i'm eight years younger than him so he was really he he was at the next life stage and uh and he was you know he, he was in his first job he was he was riding motorcycles and 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 driving cars and uh and and so he really brought a great deal of um i guess uh know-how into the workshop and and I was the pesky little brother who just got under his feet. I was fascinated by all of the uh, the equipment and the activities that he and his friends and another brother were getting up to and uh, and and uh, and that environment kind of uh, fostered my interest in electronics and and really radio. Now you're a builder, and we'll go and talk about that a little bit later. But was he a builder as well? Was that how you're inspired to be a home brewer? Yes. He was absolutely a builder. He was a home brewer and a maker and and uh, a much more careful and considered one. I mean, his work is uh, his work is of, is of, a, is of a high standard. Um, and and so he he always stretched me in terms of uh, what I could. Uh, well, there was what I could get working, but then there was what that what I could uh, potentially do to kind of mimic his. Uh, his standard of um, of radio and electronics construction. Yes, he was very much a builder. What it, what's interesting is that uh, he and his friends were into all sorts of things. In the 1970s, mini bikes and motorcycles were extremely popular. He built mini bikes, 
and he and his friends were buying old motorcycles, pulling them down, repairing them, modifying them, putting them together, riding them. And uh, so he really had a number of interests. Um, I just never really took up the mechanical side of things. I've never really understood why that was, but the mechanical things that he and his friends were doing just never interested me, like like pulling apart old Japanese transistor radios did, or uh, you know just uh, leafing through the boxes of of um, of old valves, radio chassis, and so forth that that filled up our family workshop. What's interesting is you grew up in Melbourne, Australia. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Okay. What's interesting is that in Southern California, in those days, mini bikes and motorcycles were also the rage. It's interesting how ten thousand miles away, the same kind of interests were familiar to both sides. Yes. I mean, it was a very different world back then as 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 those of us who lived through it and grew up in it would recall. Um, but really, I think for us in in uh, in Australia, we were only we were only a, a few years behind what was happening in popular culture and hobbies and 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 um, radio and electronics um, behind I think what was happening in the US. We constantly looked to the US for inspiration for magazines and and so forth. Now, did David help you get your first license? Yes, he certainly did. I, I think what happened is that. Uh, I started out, as I say, at about the age of 12, building building the, the mandatory crystal sets, one transistor radios and so forth. And, uh, and, and I pretty well graduated on to other electronics projects. While David was a, was a huge inspiration to me, there was still the matter of learning basic radio theory. And what really helped me there was that Someone, and I just can't recall how this happened, but I was introduced to a scheme run by the Wireless Institute of Australia. It was a it was a, a learn radio and electronics course. It was run in some of the schools, but it wasn't run in my school. But there was a correspondence scheme, and uh, and I signed up for that. And that was the mechanism by which I did a series of structured lessons with a with a delightful um, mentor or Elmer, um, I'll speak to speak about him in a minute. Um, a real grandfatherly figure, an ex World War II wireless operator. Um, he was over in Adelaide, and he would post me lessons and correct my lessons. And so, over a year or two years um, with this gentleman under this um, Youth Radio Club scheme, I, I was taken through. Uh, the radio and electronics theory. So, you know, simple stuff to begin with, DC, AC, resistance capacitance, and then on to inductor, inductors and um, inductive and capacitive reactance, tuned circuits, radio basics, oscillators, etc. So I kind of got my building, took my building direction from my brother and some of the things he was doing. But at the same time, I was able to learn basic radio theory through the scheme promoted by the Wireless Institute of Australia back in the mid-70s. Right, and for the younger listeners, when you say that he was posting homework and corrections for you, that wasn't on the Internet, that was in the mail, right? Absolutely, that was all handwritten, addressed and sealed and stamped, and uh, two or three days each direction, yes, it was very much all done by post. So posting in those days, you put a stamp on your tongue and put it on an envelope. Exactly, how about that? So when did you get your first license? How old were you? When the uh, the Wireless Institute's youth radio tutelage uh, drew to a close, I kind of pushed on myself. And around about that time, it was 1977, the Australian authorities offered the first novice license, which was five words a minute code and some basic theory and standard regulations. In 1977, I did that exam. I was the, in the second batch of VK novices, and at the end of 1977, I was first licensed as VK3 NCL, November Charlie Lima. And did the N after the three mean that it was a novice license? Did that have anything to do with it? Yes, exactly, yeah. All of, all of us novice licensees were, uh, were N calls, 
and uh, we had some fairly archaic restrictions on us back in those days. I think we were limited to 10 watts of carrier. Oh, gosh, I can't remember what our SSB power limit was, um, but we could operate CW, AM, um, low power SSB, and we had some quite narrow band segments. I remember we had 3525 to 3575 on 80 metres. But the biggest constraint there, Eric, was um, our transmitters had to be crystal controlled. So you can imagine that, you know, that really clipped our wings. So you have 25 kilohertz of bandwidth and you could run AM. Oh, it was uh, it was uh, 50 kilohertz, sorry, 3525 to 3575 on 80 meters. We did have some of the higher bands as well. We had allocations on, I think, 15 and 10 meters, but I might stand to be corrected on that. It was a long time ago. And what was your first rig? Well, my first rig was a homebrew 10 watt AM transmitter fortuitously and in light of the novice licenses coming about and and, uh, fresh batches of novice licensees coming onto the bands. uh, One of the local electronics magazines, Electronics Australia, published a design for a 10 watt AM transmitter. It was a very kind of conservative and conventional design. It was plate modulated. Mine had an 807, a single 807. The modulator was one that I that I inherited from my brother. It had, uh, it had, uh, it was a push-pull um, modulator. I think they were six BQ5s, but I might be wrong. Um, crystal oscillator. And so I put that on the air running uh, 10 watts of CW and 10 watts of AM into an 80-meter dipole. And once I, once I sorted out the bugs, once we ironed out a few problems, and, and I did rely on my older brother to help me to debug that and get it on the air, um, I was away. It was like uh, it was like a bird learning to fly and jumping the nest. I was I was on there every night after school, and uh, I must have made uh, oh I must have made thousands of contacts. I think. And that was with novice operators, or did ham radio operators from Australia come down into the novice band and also speak with you? Yes, that was that was an open and shared segment of eighty meters. We had uh, we had all, we had all of the licensees. Uh, well, we had the full calls, and novices able to um, to use that section of the band. So I had many QSOs with uh, with novices, many QSOs with uh, full calls, and uh, it was a great time of uh, operating and and learning and activity, and uh, just even thing basic things such as learning to hold a conversation on air, which I think is something that um, something that can be overlooked for newcomers. Right. Sometimes it just takes a lot of practice, doesn't it? For some people, I think it does. What's your favorite operating mode? Well, Eric, I'm really not that much of an operator. And I know that kind of sounds, maybe it sounds a little bit funny, but my ham radio time is is really kind of tinkering time. And, uh, and, and, and what I've found is uh, I do a lot of listening. I do occasionally come on and operate. I, there, there are some nets that I occasionally join in. But, uh, but you know, during the week or on the weekends, um, generally when I get some ham radio time, um, my soldering iron's hot. And, uh, and I've, uh, you know, I've got, a, I've got a module or a board on the bench and I'm just tinkering with it or I'm constructing or uh, perhaps I'm fitting it into a chassis just turning projects over, turning ideas over, testing, trying. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the wonder and that's the appeal of the hobby for me. If I had to answer your question, uh, if I could operate any mode anywhere, it would be CW, QRP CW on the top of a mountain. Because in recent years, maybe in the last three or four years, I've been very interested in summits on the air and uh, and that's become part of my part of my hobby, part of my exercise routine, and probably the most operating that I do. I'm not great at CW. I've I've never been great at CW, but uh, I'll tell you a little secret. If you only want to do contest style exchanges that are popular amongst the soda crowd, you don't have to be fantastically good at CW. And uh, and I've got just enough CW to complete those soda activation um, contest style exchanges 
and I get away with it. But there's really nothing else in terms of operating that gives me more pleasure than to be on top of a mountain and just work a string of CW callers. And now this message from ICOM America. Get outside and be active with ICOM's new IC705HF to UHF portable transceiver and its optional multifunction backpack. This is ICOM's perfect solution for soda and parks on the air. The ICOM IC705 is your perfect QRP companion with its base station features and functionality at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilogram or 2.2 pounds. This beautiful new rig has RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz and includes a large 4.3 inch color touch screen with a live band scope and waterfall display. The ICOM IC705 will be the replacement in amazing 21st century baseband rig for microwave DXers, rovers, and contesters, and the operating choice for those under the new S-Hale geosynchronous satellite footprint. Unbelievable. The radio is 5 watts with its internal battery and 10 watts with an external 13.8 volt power supply. This full-featured radio operates on single sideband CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions. Included in this package is a micro USB connector, Bluetooth to support linking to your smartphone or Bluetooth headset, built-in Wi-Fi, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, micro SD card slot, and the HM243 speaker microphone, which is standard equipment. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the optional backpack, the LC192, with a special compartment for your IC705 with plenty of room for antennas, cables, and other gear to get you on the air from the mountaintop or the local park. There is a link to this amazing new rig on the QSO Today podcast website for this episode. And when you order your new ICOM IC705 from your favorite ham radio dealer, be sure to tell them that you heard about it here on QSO Today. My thanks to ICOM America for their continued support of the QSO Today podcast. And now back to our QSO Today. Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? Partially. I was completely fascinated and enthralled in in ham radio and electronics and communications as I was finishing schooling. And I did really consider it. I considered engineering very carefully. Um, So what I did was I enrolled in a science degree uh, at at one of the universities in Melbourne. And I did the first year of, uh, of engineering. So it was like engineering 101. And my cunning plan was to uh, to do that for a while and uh, and pursue science or pursue engineering, and I could I could pick up either at the end of my first year. But during that first year, I got so interested in computer science, which was the year was 1979, so you can imagine it was computer science was in uh, see really. Um, but I just got so drawn into the world of computer science that I completely lost interest in any any notion of doing engineering. And uh, so I dropped out of engineering and I just, uh, I just uh, pressed on with computer science, which, which I stayed with and have stayed with all my, all my working life. So I've worked, in, I've worked in IT. For 20 or so years, I was a software engineer. And for the last 20 or so years, I've, uh, I still work in IT, but I'm, I'm more in the business end of IT. So, um, so I've been doing IT since I graduated from university. That's about 38 years, which is quite startling when I say it. Let's go back to soda for a second. You mentioned in some of the research that I've done, you talk about your summits on the air and where you like to go. Apparently, there's some 1,500-meter mountains not far from Melbourne. What are the essentials that you carry on foot to the top of the summit? Well, let me start by saying that uh, soda is administered under, uh, under regions. It's administered by regions within, within um, jurisdictions or within states. So in VK3, well, in VK, I think, or at least certainly in VK3, a 1,500 metre mountain or summit um, scores you 10 points. So the point allocation is all a function of um, the uh, the relative height of the, of the mountains that are available to you to climb. 
So a 1,500-metre mountain might not seem like, uh, you know, a huge one for, for some listeners, particularly your listeners in uh, the U.S., California or the, uh, the Northwest or other parts of the States or Canada. Where you have teeners. Indeed, yes. But for us, 1,500 metres is a 10-pointer. Um, the, the points that you score for activating a summit bear no, have no bearing on uh, uh, how difficult or easy it is to get to the top. So in some cases, it can be a, it can be a grueling overnight hike to get to the top of a 10-pointer, and in other cases, you can drive to the top. But uh, So really, what I pack depends on um, what's involved in getting there. But, um, but I pack a homebrew transceiver, um, and uh, Soda has given me a, 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 uh, a fantastic focus for my homebrew efforts. And um, I've spent the last three or four years really kind of iterating and refining my approach to designing and building relatively compact and lightweight Soda rigs. So um, yeah, I take the regular things. I take uh, I take a homebrew transceiver. I take a uh, uh, a 4S lipo pack, which is usually uh, four ampere hours or thereabouts. Um, for an antenna, I use a link dipole. One of the reasons for that is that my homebrew rigs don't have inbuilt tuners, so I need a resonant antenna on each of the bands that I work, which are typically um, 40, 30, and 20. I have some uh, have some 80 meter tails for my for my link dipole, which I do use on occasion as well. Um, you need a logbook, and, and most importantly, you need uh, water, food, a snake bite um, or a snake snake bite kit, which might be something that's more uniquely Australian than you might need elsewhere. And uh, of course, you need a smartphone with um, navigation on it. Although I haven't been I haven't been as adventurous as some, so I'm not quite as fully equipped as some with sort of sophisticated GPS and EPIRB systems. But there are still plenty of uh, fabulous mountain walks and hikes that I can do um, within two or three hours' drive of Melbourne. And uh, you don't need sophisticated equipment to enjoy doing those. So what I've learned about Australia over the years from reading is that if it's beautiful in Australia, it's probably poisonous. Yeah, yeah, yes. You do. You do need to be careful uh, what logs you turn over, and um, uh, you know wh- where you uh, where you sit down. The sort of places that I've typically been um, are, um, you know, there, there's there's no real danger as long as you just keep your eyes open. And of course, most snakes that you're likely to come across in Australia are poisonous, and some of them are the some of the most poisonous snakes in the world, but Generally speaking, they're more afraid of you, and um, if you just don't provoke them and step around them, just watch them carefully, um, they'll typically just turn and disappear into into the grass or into the bushes. So I'm not aware of uh, any um, really dangerous situations that have arisen amongst any of the uh, the VK soda activators. When you say link dipole, just for the listeners, what you're talking about is a dipole that has alligator clips to make the dipole electrically longer for each band? Yes, exactly. So I start off with a 20-meter dipole. In fact, I made one of these a couple of weeks ago. So I build a conventional dipole for 20 meters, and then at the end where you... And then I resonate that, and then at the ends on on the uh, the, uh, phenolic or um, or, or insulating, uh, insulating pieces at the ends... Um, you, uh, you string another length for the next band of interest, which for me is 30 metres. Um, so what's that, another four, four or so metres, four or five metres? Um, and, uh, and you have a clip or an alligator clip or a banana plug and socket, whatever mechanism you like. If you leave that open, the whole antenna um, functions as, a, as, as the uh, shortest open dipole elements. And if you want to go to a lower band, you just drop the ends close the circuit, and, uh, and your next dipole. So you just work out from the middle. So I've, I've worked, out, worked out from uh, a resonant 20-metre dipole, um, put, put additional lengths on for 30 metres, close the circuit at the join, resonate that for 30 metres, do the same for 40, and, and there's a three-band linked dipole. Now, there's a lot of people that do soda that like the end-fed wire with a 9-to-1 ballon on the end. 
What do you use? Because, you know, part of the reason that most people don't like a dipole, I guess, for soda is that you actually have to support it in the center. Do you actually take something with you to support your antenna in the center? Yes, and I had omitted that from my inventory, didn't I? I always have to take a squid pole. Well, most of the times I'll take a squid pole. I have uh, four or five poles, but my favorite is is a uh, is a nine meter pole um, that was a ten meter pole, but the top very thin, flexible segment of it broke, so it's now a nine meter pole, and that co- collapses in nine one meter lengths down to one meter. So the whole thing can fit in my backpack, even though it sticks out the top. As for uh, NSAIDs, they are very popular, and one of the reasons is uh, is that you don't need coax because well you only need a short length of coax whereas with my linked dipole I need seven or eight meters or nine meters of coax to get up to the the feed point at the center um, i I haven't experimented with n feds really at all um, and uh, I might do that one day but uh, I've just stuck with the linked dipole and uh, and, and I've been, I've been uh, content with that. One of the things that I'd say about my efforts in the hobby is that I've really concentrated on building transceivers, receivers, transmitters, receivers, and the radio communications modules. And I think I could have really invested the same amount of effort in doing antennas, but I've only got so much time. So... I think one of the ways that I've really kind of managed to focus in on what I love doing is to just concentrate on that and and just keep other aspects of activating and other aspects of making and and other aspects of my hobby as simple as possible. So um so that's where I that, that's my explanation for not having experimented widely with soda antennas. I saw a conversation that you had in one of the blogs where someone was saying that they take a single band transceiver with them and you said well now you know what a three band transceiver is a lot more useful what is there about your transceiver that you built that makes it more than ideal for you for soda work i think i uh i did start out soda uh three or four years ago um on a on a very simple very low budget basis i, I had a i had a kit 40 meter single sideband transceiver five watts qrp no cw and I haul that little kit radio up to uh, summits for about a year before I kind of moved on and started designing and building um, multiband rigs and rigs that did CW as well. That kit was from an Australian designer and, and kit company. Um, it's, called a, it's called an MST and it's by OzQRP. Some of your listeners might have seen those kits. They're excellent kits and the radio is an excellent performer, but it's monoband. I just quickly found that uh, um, I was missing out on a lot of fun and I was missing out on being able to make my make, make the mountain available to chasers on other bands or on CW. So even though I was really rough in CW, I just kept, uh, kept, kept listening to it and uh, following other people's QSOs and eventually built my familiarity back up to the point where I was game enough to um, to have CW QSOs and once I started it, it became much easier. What I realized by lugging that monoband um, sideband transceiver kit around was that there were times when you really needed to work across multiple bands to uh, to make the most of propagation openings. So really the the, the best chance of success is if you can either start low and work high, so work from, say, 80, 40, 20, or high and work low, 20, 30, 40, sometimes 80. And uh, and the activators who are more experienced than I think who get better results and who give the chasers, you know, a kind of much better access to, uh, to the mountain um, are doing that. So they're working three or four bands, they're working sideband and CW, and they're just maximising... Uh, their chances of making contacts and uh, Chase's chances of getting the contact with that activated summit. So I realised if I was going to build a transceiver, then it really needed to be a three-band transceiver at a minimum and, uh, and, and it needed to do CW as well as SSB. And so from about two years ago, um, I started building uh, transceivers or, or 
um, I started uh, contemplating and building transceivers uh, for um, for at least uh, two bands, but I've built uh, two transceivers that do four and one does six bands. And, and that just allows me to move around. Hey, this is Eric for just another short break. One of my favorite ham radio podcasts is the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, hosted by George, KJ6VU, my guest in episode 232, and Jeremy, KF7IJZ. George and Jeremy take a bi-weekly deep dive into their favorite ham radio workbench projects and the technologies that fascinate them. If you want to be a ham radio builder or just be inspired, click on the link in this week's show notes page. You do a lot of projects with the popular SI5351 synthesizer. Is this the best product to use with the Arduino controller now? For me, it is, Eric, and for a lot of experimenters. The SI5351 is a remarkable IC. It, it, does, uh, it does clock generation from DC to 160 megahertz. The, uh, the ability to have the clock frequency and other essential characteristics of the clock under software control is, is quite remarkable. Um, other devices, other, other clock generators or um, synthesizers or PLLs will do it. Um, I've just had success with the SI5351, as many other home brewers have done, and so I've really stuck with it. And there are multiple reasons for that. I mean, one of them is that there are some excellent libraries for, um, for the SI5351. So even though I've written my own script for an Arduino controller, I really got the benefit of the SI5351 library uh, from Jason Mildrum, NT7S. And uh, there are other libraries by many other very, very talented uh, software developers as well. So really, it, it's a piece of cake to, uh, to set frequency, to enable and disable the clock, which is an oscillator, um, to, uh, and, and to do other fun- features and functions uh, to control the clock, which is effectively your VFO or BFO. Um, it's really made controlling a super hit transceiver or receiver or transmitter um, just uh, oh, an order of magnitude easier than it has been in the past. Now, there are some concerns or there were some concerns about uh, phase noise with SI5351. Most of the rigs that I'm building and experimenting with are not high-end transceivers. You know, they're not going to line up with the uh, the top of the line or even the mid-range ICOM or, uh, or other transceivers. They're just not in that league. But um, my interest has always been in simplicity, but adequate performance. And, uh, and I'm completely satisfied with the receiver performance uh, and the spectral performance that I'm getting out of uh, these homebrew transceivers and receivers and transmitters that use SI5351. I'm working well within its limitations on the sorts of circuits and, uh, and, and rigs that I can reproduce on my home workbench. You built an Arduino library of code to work with the SI5351. What's so unique about your library versus Jason's, for example? My code is, is the main control script for a, for a VFO. It's copied. Uh, you know, like many of the features in my code are... Um, have been copied and inherited and uh, and mimicked from uh, many other um, Arduino uh, enthusiasts around around the uh, around the, the ham radio community. Um, that's the wonderful thing about uh, about open source and about the uh, the sharing spirit in the ham community when it comes to um, to, to Arduino and to um, and to, to using uh, software controlled digital devices in ham radio. So really all I did was I, uh, I took one of the existing um, SI5351 control and transceiver control scripts um, as a basis. There were some things that didn't suit me, so I started modifying the code. I started introducing features and taking some out, and I just customized it for the particular transceiver project that I was working on. And, uh, and I found it really remarkably easy to do. Now... I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm using, I'm benefiting, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants such as Jason and some of the other library coders, um, all of which are open source and freely available. 
So much like uh, Jason and uh, Hans Summers, they've done some amazing work to um, to uh, dig through the complexities of SI 5351 and to take care of the uh, uh, of, uh, of 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 uh, or to come up with mechanisms that um, that hide the complexities. Um, so really, my script is is a control script. So all it does is it um, it controls the SI 5351. Um, it does a number of uh, control features for a receiver, transmitter, or transceiver. So it handles the transmit receive switching, handles the sequencing, does receiver muting, uh, controls transmit receive relays. Uh, in a multi-band uh, transceiver or rig, it uh, it controls the um, band pass uh, filter switching, the low pass filter switching. Um, as well, it monitors the display and the front panel controls. So it monitors push buttons um, and uh, it can also monitor analog inputs. So there's code in there to, um, to take uh, um, DC readings off, off uh, RF sensors for a relative RF uh, power meter. Um, there's code in there for SWR meter and S meter and so forth. As well, Eric, I, um, I, I put together code for a, a simple Kia. And so I packed the Kia code in there as well. So once you've got a Kia in there, then you can integrate the Kia's break-in or semi-break-in in with the transmit-receive sequencing. So it all kind of came together, and uh, I've been very pleased with it. I've used it in probably about 10, maybe a dozen VFOs, most of which are in transmitters or transceivers projects. And because it's open source up on GitHub, I, I regularly get uh, uh, queries and um, emails about people who have taken it and used it or want some help to get it going or, um, you know, just want to want to chat about how they're using it in, in their particular projects. So it's there along with uh, lots of other um, transceiver and SI5351 uh, control scripts for people to use if they like. Have you built yet your ultimate... QRP transceiver, and if you haven't, what would it contain? No, I don't think I've built the ultimate transceiver yet. Each time I take on one of these projects, and and assuming I see it through to to completion, it's a massive learning exercise. And once the rig is complete and I'm able to use it, usually um you know there's a great sense of satisfaction, but there's also a kind of a sense of um, there's an awareness of all the things that it could do better. There's an awareness of uh, um, improvements that could be made, you know, to the concept, to the physical design, the layout, um, the transceiver's operation, um, basic characteristics such as the bands that it covers or the, the, the power that it, that it supports, um, its overall power budget, all of these you know, it's it sort of um, it, it's feature to weight ratio. All of these things, all of these things have to be traded off when you're when you're thinking about how you're going to put your transceiver together. And inevitably, you start off with something that really does seem like the ultimate homebrew QRP transceiver in your mind. But by the time you've kind of dug your way through all of the construction of it and, and ironed out the bugs and, and, you know, you've had to substitute components in for the ones that you wanted to use and maybe you've had some instability or oscillations or, uh, you know, something hasn't worked as well. Maybe you've had to pull a whole module out or a whole stage and you've replaced it. All these sorts of things happen along the way. The, the thing that you have to realise that, that came to me uh, early on once I started this, this home brewing again, Eric, is that everything you do is a one-off. When you're a home brewer in this fashion, everything's a prototype. So you get the thing finished and you're not going to build a second one. So when you come to build the next one, it's going to be improved. It's going to be slightly different. So I don't think I'll ever build the ultimate homebrew QR pre transceiver. I think that's just, you know, that, that, that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's an unachievable vision. I'll just build the next one and it'll be better than the last one in some way that, that matters to me. How do you package your creations? I've started using uh, aluminium angle and sheet aluminium. And if you have a look at some of the transceiver pictures and videos on my blog, you'll, 
you'll, you'll get a pretty clear idea of how I do that and how it looks. I've found, uh, I've found that angle aluminium can be quite simply pop riveted or, um, or, or bolted with uh, M2, M2.5 and M3 nuts and bolts onto a, an, say a uh, one point, well, a two millimeter, 1.5 or two millimeter thick aluminium base plate. Um, so I usually use a, a thicker piece of aluminium for the front panel and often the back panel. That gives the front panel some kind of uh, sturdiness, some solidity, um, some thinner angle of the same dimensions for the sides. And, and then I, I organise to have a drop-in lid. And that creates the chassis. I, I guess I've uh, I, I've sort of got stuck on 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 the form factor that um, that, that is that that is derived from from the 1970s CB transceivers, or if you want to think in ham terms, think of the think of the Yaesu FT7. You know that was a kind of a like a like a rectangular chassis, um, and it had a and all of these rigs and CB transceivers. They they all had a under the dashboard mounting bracket. Um, you could swing the bracket underneath, and it would prop the transceiver up so that it was kind of you know the front was angled up and it was looking at you. Um, again, stylized a little bit like the uh, the HP or some of that premium test gear from the 1970s. Um, they that test gear had these uh, these really beautiful um, carry handles that would fold down underneath, and they would they would angle the front panel up, and so that the front panel was was kind of staring you right in the face. And I've never really moved on from that kind of whole design aesthetic, which is which is in contrast with where most of the QRP uh, portable um, design products have gone. So if you look at um, any of Steve Weber's kits, you know, they're, they're just, uh, they're perfection in how, how they've been miniaturised. Um, and, uh, of course, the Elecraft um, uh, KX3, KX2, um, magnificent pieces of, of design and, and engineering. They've gone, they've gone, and then the MCHF is another one in this category. So, so they've realised that actually a really convenient form factor for operating portable is if the rig just lies on a flat surface and you look down on it from above. And that's the disadvantage that my 1970s CB form factor has. You can't look down on it from above. But I kind of rationalise that by, by, uh, by the fact that I'm not actually operating it portable all that much. Most of the time I'm operating it on the shack bench. So I choose that form factor with the sort of conventional all controls on the front panel, a few overflow controls on the rear panel. I, I sort of rationalise that on the basis that actually most of its use is going to be on the shelf in front of me where I sit at my bench. Well, I think one of the advantages of what you're describing, and I think that I remember the Elecraft K2 had the same kind of chassis where they were using aluminum square bar stock and flat plates to kind of put the chassis together. But it seems to me that one of the advantages of the way that you're doing it is that you're not building for the box. You can build the project and then put the box around it. That's true. And, and that's, that's the big advantage and the kind of design challenge that you get if you scratch build. And, uh, you know, if you're prepared to do a little bit of extra work and take on scratch building, you can, you can make your boards do your internal layout uh, and, uh, you know, choose your module boundaries and choose your chassis and your boxing. You can choose to do that however you like. I've actually started in in my last couple of builds to um, to, to, uh, to, dis, to decide on, well, I've started the project by uh, by working out the physical size of the chassis um, so there's a transceiver on my blog. I call it Summit Prowler 6. And I, I built that project. It's the most compact transceiver I've built. And look, it was a, it was a headache, but, but it really was a satisfying challenge. I started it out by deciding that I would build a four-band SSB CW transceiver, five watts, um, into a chassis of a particular compact dimension. So I built the chassis, and then I set about basically packing it all in in a way it was it, it was a kind of it was kind of a personal challenge to do that and 
look, I paid a price because I, I ended up going to uh, going to some lengths to to pack in componentry, which I never thought I would ever have to attempt. Um, so, for instance, I, um, ra- I did, there were there were there were a couple of places where I didn't have a room in that build for a um, FT thirty seven forty three, which is the uh, you know the um, sort of standard uh, toroid for for um, for winding uh, wideband coupling transformers, and so I actually uh, I, I didn't have room to even put one of those in to squeeze one of those in. So so I had to come up with an equivalent inductor for an output um, of a gain stage, a broadband uh, output transformer, which I wound on a ferrite bead. I hope I never have to do that again, Eric. It, it was kind of overstretching, and it was. It was many, many hours, and I have to say that um, when you pack things in that tight, um, uh, working on it um, can uh, can become a chore. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I enjoy using that transceiver, and uh, and I'm very proud of how much I managed to pack into a compact space. But I can tell you that if it ever requires major rebuild, um, it, it's going to require some real fortitude. And now this message from QRP Labs. QRP Labs has shipped thousands of QCX QRP transceivers kits to date. The odds of working another QCX user gets better every day. If you're looking for a satisfying kit experience where you end up with an amazing performing QRP transceiver for under $50, let me say that again, for under $50, then you owe it to yourself to go to QRP Labs. We have many home brewers who listen to the QSO Today podcast. For you, QRP Labs also has parts, filters, enclosures, and other handy devices to make your home brewing experience even better. You can use these parts to either enhance your QRP Labs kits or to beef up your own homebrew designs. Be sure to browse Hans' entire website. Use the link on this week's show notes page or the one in the sponsored section of the QSO Today website to get to QRP Labs to buy your QCX or any of the other fine QRP Labs kits or parts. QRP Labs is my go-to ham radio kit company. It should be yours, too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO Today. In your blog, you talk about your love and fascination with AM that apparently started a long time ago. Can you provide a little bit more background and how do you act on this love of AM now? Well, I think that goes back to uh, the, my early years in, in amateur radio, which, as I mentioned uh, earlier, was in the 1970s. AM was a, a popular mode on 160 metres, and there was even AM on 40 metres. It was quite common. I think it was the same in, in the States. Certainly was the case here. Um, AM just sounded... Uh, quite uh, quite special on um, many of the uh, the big old valve receivers that we had in those days and uh, even the solid state or partly solid state receivers and transceivers had uh, had wide filters in them some of them didn't even really have filters at all and uh, you know low IS such as 455 KC and and big speakers and and uh, you know the uh, the sound of uh, AM on one of those old boat anchors, um, almost seems like something that has been lost. And so uh, recently, I um, I decided that I would build a, an AM receiver, and uh, you know just just see if I could build a receiver that was purely focused on AM, and and then cut it for bands and frequencies where I would find AM transmissions. So I built up an AM receiver, which was fairly conventional receiver. The details are on my blog. And, uh, and I experimented with an infinite impedance detector, which is a circuit component that I'd never used before. And that worked really quite well. The other critical component of an AM receiver is the IF filters. But I got onto a source of 455 kilohertz um, uh, very varying bandwidth uh, ceramic filters from uh, one of the suppliers in, um, in in Australia. So I got some of those. I put this receiver together, and I was really I was really delighted with its performance. It, it had a good distribution of gain. It was stable, um, and uh, you know the filter bandwidth really took me back to to the, the heyday of AM, I guess. 
So then where to find AM signals? Well, there were always AM signals in Melbourne on 160 metres. There's a lot of sideband and CW as well, but there's a, there are regular AM nets on 160. So I built a bandpass filter for uh, 160. Um, I built bandpass filters for um, a whole lot of other frequencies as well. So I built one for 80 metres where there is occasional AM. 40 metres, there's quite a lot of AM on uh, on particular nets in uh, on the eastern states in VK. So I built a 40 metre bandpass filter. And then I built bandpass filters for uh, WWV and WWVH, so 5 megahertz and 10 megahertz. And then I thought, well, I'll take this one, one step further and I built a bandpass filter for about 400 kilohertz. And um, down in long wave, there are AM um, aircraft navigation beacons. So by the time that project was finished, I was able to just um, cycle up through those bands and, uh, and, and you know, at, at optimal receiving times, I, was, I had a pretty good chance of hearing a, a lovely, broad, sonorous, resonant AM signal all the way from uh, 398 kilohertz where there's a local um, aircraft beacon up to 160, 80, uh, uh, 5 megahertz, WWV or WWVH, um, 40 meters and, uh, and, and 10 megahertz. And, and that, was, uh, that was great fun. That gets me to the transmitters. Over the last year or so, I've always had an ambition to get on, on 160 AM. There's a very active uh, 11 AM coffee break group in, uh, in Melbourne. And there are quite a few other stations that operate 160 metres in the evenings on uh, some weeknights. And I just had an unmet ambition to, to come up with an AM transmitter uh, so that I could join in on those nets. And, uh, and so that started me down the path of learning about uh, AM. Now, for a QRP guy like me, um, a 50-watt carrier AM transmitter is quite a different thing altogether. So I, I kind of moved into a different space over the last 12 months or so. I started with a transmitter called the FAT5. This is from... Uh, uh, two English gentlemen who, um, who who came up with this design. So so it's a class D switching power amplifier stage, and uh, they give you a choice of a pulse width modulator or a conventional linear modulator. So I built both, and I got that transmitter working. Boy, did I smoke a lot of components. Um, when you go from running things off 12 volts to running things off 50 to 60 volts, you um, you know you're really in a different league. So I had a lot to learn. I generated a lot of smoke, a lot of dead components, um, and, uh, and I learned an awful lot in a short space of time. But eventually I settled that transmitter down and I was able to put it on the 160 meter AM net and, uh, and I was given a rousing welcome and, uh, and, and that, was, that was a great sense of achievement. One of the, one of the gentlemen in the 160 meter community, um, very, very talented RF designer, um, shared with me some of his circuits. And, uh, and so for my second AM transmitter project, I built up a much, um, much larger transmitter and, and built to his design. It, it's quite sim- similar, but, uh, but it uses an H-bridge configuration, which, uh, which um, again is class D. So these are switching power stages. So they consist of uh, four um, higher powered field effect transistors that are, that are switching on and off in the appropriate sequence. Um, H-bridge technology is the same kind of uh, circuit configuration or technology that is used for motor controllers. Um, so I built two of those modules, each one capable of easily delivering 100 watts of, of continuous carrier. And, uh, and I rigged them into a, uh, a power combiner, an RF power combiner. So, so that configuration on a rail of about, about uh, 40 to 50 volts um, is able to deliver a good 200 watts of carrier into a 50 ohm load. And then for the modulator, I built, I built another pulse width modulator um, and the necessary preamps and control circuitry. And, uh, and that pulse, and, and that does the, um, that does the modulation of the um, class D switching stage. 
Um, there's, there's quite a bit of material on my blog that takes you through the whole story of these AM transmitters. Um, it's been a great learning experience. I can tell you that um, Class D and pulse width modulation is a completely different game to, um, to QRP, CW and SSB, but it's been worth it. You have a number of famous QRP operators and builders in Melbourne, including Peter Parker, VK3YE, who was a guest years ago on the QSO Today podcast in episode 84. Do you have a QRP club there to share projects and project ideas? No, we don't as such, but we, we've got a pretty active um, local amateur radio scene. Um, Peter really is a figurehead, and, uh, you know, we... Um, we just uh, we we love seeing the content that he just produces at a prolific rate. Um, he he's uh, he's um, he is the uh, he's the go-to guy for, uh, for for all sorts of ideas and inspiration about QRP and and doing things effectively, but as simply as possible. One of the great things that Peter's been doing in recent years is QRP by the Bay. And, uh, and and that's what we used to call in the old days. We used to call that an eyeball. That's when hands all get together and uh, and have a face to face QSO. And and that's become a real regular fixture. So I think Peter might do that. Certainly does it uh, three times a year. He certainly does a summer one and he does a winter one. I think he might might do it a, a, an, an extra one as well. So we all go down to uh, Chelsea Beach, which is about 30 kilometres south from where, I'm, where I live. And uh, hams come from all over Melbourne and a little bit further afield. And we just uh, descend on the picnic tables there. We put up squid poles. We, uh, we fire up a barbecue, um, share some drinks and, and uh, snacks. And, and we just wander around and, and do a show and tell. And it's it's... It's great fun. It's really great fun. Peter's always there with one of his latest projects, and uh, and and it's a real. There's a real sense of community. As well as that, Eric, we're pretty well off for um, for for active radio clubs. So uh, there are a number of radio clubs across Melbourne. I think there are probably um, a good five or six that are very active and have good memberships. Um, I'm a member of uh, an Eastern Suburbs radio club. That club has been running, I think, since the 1960s and, uh, and is a very strong club. So we've got no shortage of uh, inspiration, no shortage of places to go to, um, to meet and to talk ham radio, well, at least in normal times. Yeah, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 outbreak where most of us are in some kind of quarantine. What are your quarantine projects now? Oh, that's a good question. I've got a, a, a portable AM transmitter project that I'm working on right now, Eric. It's a transmitter and a receiver in the same box. So one of the things that I've that I've kind of learned to do um, while I've been building radios is to um, is to buy two of everything. And uh, the backstory to this is that on on one of my um, portable QRP rigs, the um, the liquid crystal display uh, backlight failed, and uh, and I kind of kept using it for quite a while, but in the end it it annoyed me, and so I decided that I would uh, I would dig that liquid crystal display out of the transceiver and I'd and I'd replace one replace it with a with one with a working backlight. When I took it out, I found that the one the replacement liquid crystal displays that I could get did not match. They didn't exactly match. And the whole VFO and display and, and Arduino assembly was kind of so tightly packed in that I really had to do major surgery to fit a replacement LCD in, um, which I did. But, you know, it was a big effort. I remember just getting to the end of that day and thinking, wow, that was a lot of effort for kind of, you know, for a job that should have been simple. So my takeaway from that is when I order some components, I always order enough for two. So when I order a display for use in a transceiver project, I'll always buy two because there are so many ways that you can damage or lose the first one. I mean, when you build things, 
you're always blowing things up, aren't you? I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I think it doesn't really matter um, how careful you are. Eventually, you uh, you have a lead with 12 volts kind of fall off and fall onto a dangerous part of the circuit board or uh, or you slip with a drill or, um, or you know, you... Uh, um, you do something else careless that results in a destroyed display or a destroyed component. Anyway, when I was building the switching modules for the 200 watt AM transmitter, I actually took this um, this twinning technique to the next level. So I built a I built a third RF module, and that was really handy because while I was building and and setting up the other two, I could always bring the third one up in a test jig, t- testing into a dummy load with some drive on a bench power supply, and I could measure voltages, compare voltages, you know, compare component temperatures. Um, and so the idea of having a working twin, um, I-, I think, is uh, I think has been useful. So when that 200 watt AM transmitter was finished, I had I had another transmitter module just sitting there. So what I decided to do is I'll, I thought, well, I'll, I'll I'll build the other modules that I need with this transmitter module. Um, it was a, actually it was a transmitter and a pulse width modulator all on the same board. Um, I'll build those into a chassis and uh, and I'll set it up so that I can take it portable and do 160 meters portable. So that's going to be my uh, that's going to be my isolation project. My my kind of vision here is that when this is all done, I'll be and and, uh, and when we're allowed to move around, I'll be able to take this transmit a receiver to a to a mountaintop or to a park or somewhere that's really low noise I'll be able to throw an inverted L wire up as high as I can get it into a tree I'll be able to clamp onto the rail of a of a of, of a fence or of a um, you know a, um, a pier rail if I'm down visiting Peter Parker at Chelsea Beach or or maybe the uh, the galvanized rail that runs around the uh, Runs around the fence on a on, on a field, and and I'll be able to put 20 or 30 watts of AM onto 160 meters. So that's my vision, and uh, that's that's my project. The power supply for it is going to have to be a stack of lipos, um, unless I can work out some sort of um, some sort of mechanism to use an inverter. But at this stage, I'll probably um, stack some lipo packs together to get that 40 40 or 50 volts. So that's my uh, that, that's on my workbench right now, Eric. So, Paul, you know that everyone listening right now who's also in quarantine in some way is sitting here listening to you and saying, okay, how do I get started? So the question I have for you is, do you have a favorite resource for getting started on a new project, especially if you need some help in terms of maybe technical background or something like that? What's your go-to resource? I think I've relied on a few resources, um, Eric, to kind of help me through the inevitable challenges uh, when taking on these these projects. The first one is that um, I was absolutely uh, absolutely enthralled for for at least a couple of years with with two of the online forums. Um, one of them is the Bidex Twenty Group, and so um, to get there. You can find it in in groups.io, and uh, the Bidex20 group hosted the community um, led by um, Farham VU2ESE during the whole development of the Bidex series of radios, and uh, and that was just uh, that was an exciting place to be during that whole period when when Farhan bought the first Bidex40 um, to, to the market. And, and then people got their hands on the Bit X40 and, uh, and, and started modding, modding it and casing it and, um, you know, hacking it. That was just so dynamic. Every day that I'd look, I'd check into the Bit X20 group, there would be, there'd be 40 or 50 new posts and there was a real level of buzz. There was a real excitement about what was going on. Then, of course, when the Ubit X launched, it, it all, it all started again. That's a tremendous, tremendous resource that was a tremendous resource for me just to understand um how that how that architecture worked and uh and and i I just posted all sorts of questions and and issues and and problems and and thoughts and um you know uh 
queries to that group and the level of expertise on that group was was phenomenal and uh and and questions questions were answered in in hours or you know overnight at worst so i drew a great deal of uh, knowledge and inspiration from that online community and there are there are there are many others like it so if you want to build something even if you know, regardless of what it is if it's an antenna or a transceiver or a tuner or uh you know some other component i think it's I think the best thing to do is to find a community of people who are doing whatever it is you want to do and uh, and get in there and engage. On QRP rigs, um, the the Superhit designs, the technology that I'm working with really dates to the 90s to the early 2000s. So despite the fact that my VFOs are digital and my controller is digital, um, I'm not doing at this stage any any um, analog to digital conversion or SDR. So really, the preeminent resource for me has been um, a book called um, Experimental Methods in RF Design um, by uh, Wes Hayward, W7ZOI, and other authors. It, it really was. Uh, it, it has been inspirational to have that book and to work through it. It's very well thumbed. And if you're in the space that I've been working in, um, QRP rigs, that, that's been a fantastic resource. What kind of impact has amateur radio had on your family life? Well, really, when I think about that question, um, I, I just think of, uh, I think of the, the shared interest that I've had with my brother, David. Um, it's really been very special to have... Uh, um, such closely aligned interests with a brother. I'm one of three, so uh, I have two older brothers, and and we all have, we all get on well, and we all have a great relationship. Um, and I share other things with my other brother, but um, having a brother who was just curiously and you know circumstantially interested in such very similar things. And uh, and was prepared to to kind of guide me along, and still guides me along. Has been just the most fantastic uh, support for me. Um, and a wonderful thing is that he's just retired, and so as a result of that, he's got some more time on his hands, and so he's been able to uh, join me in some of the uh, some of the ham radio outings that I've been doing. So he's been coming to QRP by the bay. And uh, he's come and helped me on some activations. As for my uh, my my other family, no, I haven't really had any uh, any home runs there. Um, they all have their own interests, and uh, um, you know they haven't particularly picked up the uh, picked up the hobby or picked up what I've been doing. Um, but they do interesting things as well, and there are some similarities in the things that they do. In that they do quite kind of immersive craft-like activities as well. So um, I think uh, doing ham radio in the fashion that I'm doing it, I'm kind of able to appreciate their craft work as well. What do you think the greatest challenge is facing amateur radio now? I think it's. Uh, I think there are a couple of things that are frequently commented on, um, Eric. One is just that our, our ageing membership is, and, and demographic is... Um, is unavoidable. I think that uh, you know, if I look, if, if I was to look around the attendance at QRP by the Bay, or if I was to look around the attendance at some of our bigger ham fests, it would mirror what you would see, or what your US listeners would see. Um, you know, most people are middle age or older, and most people are male, and so I think uh, I think that's um, you know that's a, that's a real challenge. On the bright side, though. Um, there's a lot of activity and interest in in digital making, digital hacking, and uh, you know young people who are who are in their twenty, their teens, their twenties, and their thirties and their forties, um, and and a lot of middle aged people and older people as well um, are, um, are are really uh, doing some remarkable work with um, with digital electronics. So single um, single board computers and uh, embedded controllers, um, 
the capabilities of which have just gone through the roof in recent years. I mean, the the rate at which this technology make and the maker space is expanding and developing is phenomenal. So I think that some of those people might cross over to communications and into amateur radio, particularly the kind of high end and technical end of amateur radio. So digital satellites, SDR, etc. cetera. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that that will happen. But I think it's inevitable that in, in the next, decade or two, the hobby is going to start to look quite different. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? I think exactly those digital opportunities, just the way that availability and price to to powerful um, single board computers, embedded controllers, um, IoT and um, smart controllers, all of the breakout boards, the peripherals, the protocols, uh, the, the way that you can now buy hardware, plug it together, solderless, and, and, then, and, and pretty much do the same kind of conceptually with the software is just fantastic. The area of SDR is just, for me, it's a parallel universe. And really, I've kind of been replaying a bit of my youth over the last three or four years building these, these hardware-defined superhet radios. But... I could easily have spent that same time learning about SDR and, and building SDR radios, and uh, maybe that'll be the next chapter for me. But but I'm I'm sure that's going to I'm sure that is um, a, a completely exciting and enthralling space. Paul, do you have advice that you'd give to new or returning hams to the hobby? Well, I think uh, I guess I was a returning ham around 2015. I had a long period of inactivity. And, and just through some, uh, you know, as my as my uh, my family got to the stage where I could be freed up a little bit, and there was some there were some other changes going on, and I found myself able to spend a lot more time uh, in in hobbies. And uh, you know, the first year or so of getting back into home brewing didn't go particularly smoothly. I had a lot to learn. I had a lot to relearn. And, and there were really a number of hurdles that I had to jump. I had to work out, well, I had to remember how to kind of conceive of and put together transceivers and receivers and work out how to uh, to etch boards and how how to test and how to how to how to uh, to know something was working and how to cure problems. Um, I had to jump the Arduino and SI fifty three fifty one hurdle, and then putting them all together, there were lots of problems, lots of failures. You know, lots of times when you, you're sitting over a project and a messy workbench and, and it's not working and, and you just have that doubt, well, you know, maybe I should just give this up and turn back to brag chewing on 80 metres or, you know, go and do something different. So I think, you, uh, I, think you, I think when you come back to the hobby or if you start in the hobby, you, you just need to, uh, to try a number of things and find out where the sweet spot is for you find out what you love and find out what you're interested in, engage with the community, whether it's online or, or face-to-face or both. But, but I think have a bit of persistence because, uh, you know, it is a very technical hobby and uh, there are a lot of things that can go wrong and a lot of things don't work necessarily as you expect. It does take time and does take some experience to really get good results and excellent results. So I just think you need, a, in whatever you do, Whatever your sweet spot is, I think you need to just have a bit of persistence, stay with it, and uh, push through barriers, jump those hurdles, and, uh, and, and, and get to the point where, where you're enjoying what you're doing and you're getting positive feedback, and, and then that just reinforces the whole circle. You bring up the word persistence. Is it important to take time out every day, even if that time out is 15 minutes to a half an hour, to work on your project? Is that kind of persistence important in terms of being successful? Yes, I don't manage it every day, um, but I certainly spend some some building time and some ham radio time. Um, certainly, on, I guess on average every week. And if I, for any of the usual reasons, don't do that, I find I come back to a project or um, something that I've been doing, and I just find it's a little harder to kind of pick up where you left off. 
if you're able to spend a little bit of time on what you're doing every day, it really does come easier. That's certainly the true of operating. It's true of CW. Um, it's uh, it's true true with lots of things, and it's it's true with making and 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 lots of aspects of um, of ham radio. Uh, as a maker, as a home brewer, there are lots of things that I can do in even half an hour, even if I just wire up a board or run a test or um, you know do some component selection or order some components it just kind of keeps that momentum going so yes I think I think persistence in in short bursts is really valuable Paul you've been a wonderful guest I really appreciate your coming on to the QSO today podcast and spending this more than an hour with me with that I want to thank you so much and wish you 73. Thank you, Eric. It's been an absolute pleasure, and and I must say, I think it's an honour to uh, to be included in your social history of amateur radio. So uh, I do appreciate the uh, chance to um, to share my story very much. Thank you. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Paul. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in VK3HN in the search box at the top of the page. Be sure to click on the Expo menu item at the top of the page for updates on the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Radio Expo. I'm updating it as I have more information. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support for these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or by using QSO Today in the coupon box at the checkout. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor, monthly or annually, by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 300. QSO Today is now available at iHeartRadio and a bunch of other online audio services, including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. Special thanks to Ben Bresky, who now edits the audio for this QSO Today podcast from the audio pieces that I give him. Until next time, this is Eric 4 z one ug 73 The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.